what Summerall did at Troy this year, what Kane oh. Womack did at South Alabama. And, and now you got Trent Dilfer as the head coach at UAB. Like, past Bama and Auburn, it's an interesting time in the state of Alabama for college football. There's no doubt. And, and I think, too, the Sun Belt in general is going to be so much fun to watch next year. Southern Miss going to have a lot of that defense back. Kane, see, I love, I love what Will Hall's doing at Southern Miss saying – because. And you know this better than I do because you follow recruiting more so than I do. But I've talked to a couple of different people about it, getting ready for that game. Recruiting Mississippi is just different. The, the, the kids are different. The way you do it is different. Obviously, the academics, the size of the schools, it's all very different. So they're taking very much a, a fatherly love approach to how they're recruiting. And you see how the kids reacted. Um, I see down with what Kane's doing in Mobile. I talked to him at the Senior Bowl last year. He's doing more of the Howard Snellenberger like circle the 50 mile radius, except now you can do that in the portal. So you take that radius around Mobile, which we know how much talent's there every year, in the panhandle of Florida and say, are you not happy? Would you like to come home? Would you like to play in a brand new stadium? Great facilities, you get a chance to play in a very competitive league and look how it's working out for him. And then what Coach Summerall did at Troy, man, they had 169 yards in the bowl game and they won. I haven't seen a team in a long time, like they epitomized team football this year finding different ways to win, running the football with Kamani Vidal, throwing the football with Gunnar Watts in certain games, defense, five turnovers against UTSA. Like, they just go play hard. But he'll be the first one to admit, we always talk about buy-in, leadership, you know, having veterans on your team. Carlton Marshall, Richard Juniper came to him when he got the job and said, listen, tell us what to do. Tell us how we're going to run it and tell us what to run, and we'll take care of the rest for you. We'll get all the young guys on board. We'll lead this ship. We're going to be here for you. They bought in day one. So having some veterans, some older guys helps. But, man, there, is some, there are some programs on the rise and some great coaches in the state of Alabama that are not at Auburn and Alabama right now. So you did a game every week this year. You're on the road. You're actually on the sidelines doing reporting. You have to work during the game. I just get to stand there. But you – you get to meet with coaches a lot. You, I mean, you, did, you work with the SEC Network, so you meet a lot of SEC coaches. Um, do me a favor, and do, do folks who are watching this a favor. Number one, take them through a typical game week from a scheduling standpoint. And number two, when you interact with coaches, who are the best ones that give you probably some off-the-record stuff but give you the most detail that you can contextualize that team with? Yeah. All right. So Sunday, I usually fly home. I try to get on the first flight out. So it's, you know, six, seven, something like that. Get home. As soon as I land, it's kid time for the next couple hours because I haven't seen them since Thursday morning because I go do morning radio in Birmingham. So then I don't I leave the house and I haven't seen them. So it's been three days. So I have seven, five and two. I try to play with them a couple hours. They get rest, nap time. And then I try to dive back into games and work. Um, I have a podcast that I do on Sundays. Usually doesn't get out till Sunday evening, just reviewing SEC games. I don't have enough time to really go much further past that. It'll be different in the offseason. And then it's turn the page. We usually find out who we have the next week on Thursday evening or Friday morning going into a weekend. We'll find out who we have the next week. Now, if you ever hear the dreaded six-day option, that means we're probably not finding out until late, late, late Saturday night or Sunday morning who we're going to have the next week. So then it's turn the page. Start to grind on the two teams that you have the next week. We do a production call on Tuesday mornings. Start talking about things that we want to get into, what we want to talk about. And then it's just get as much film, as much research in. The benefit that I have of just doing SEC games most weeks is I know coaches. I know guys who cover the team. I know assistants on every team. So when I get Kentucky, I've got my four or five guys that I call. All right, what's happening with this guy? What's happening here? Who do I need to talk about here? When I get Georgia, I call these guys. We talk about this guy's injuries, whatnot, who's going to play more. And a lot of times those are guys on the staff that I can have a conversation with or what it is not. And so then we go to town. I go Thursday evening. I'll do my radio show from the hotel Friday morning, and then we have coaches' meetings. So we usually get head coach, both coordinators, most times a player or two. Sometimes it's just the coaches. It depends. Um, if, the co if the opposite team is staying in town, We'll go meet with them at their hotel that evening. So usually Friday, 4.30, 5.30, something like that. And we'll have the same situation. We'll meet with the coaches and players. If they're not close, and it's a school like Ole Miss, they usually kind of stay out of town. We'll do Zoom calls with them during the week, and then we'll get that over with. Some coaches just still like to do the Zoom calls. We'll knock those out during the week. Then Saturday morning, we have our production meeting for the actual game. We go through graphics, 
storylines, things we want to talk about, what we're going to do in our open, um, you know, certain guys that we want to watch. We'll talk to guy, the, the producer director about our cameraman need to focus in on certain guys. Like, do we want to follow Trey Smith for an entire drive? And let me just talk about offensive line play. So Jordan doesn't have to waste everybody's time talking about routes and coverages, things that nobody cares about. And so we kind of hammer all that out, get to the stadium about two and a half hours for kick. That's when the good stuff really happens. Because once you get in the stadium, Josh, and you've probably had this just floating around talking to people, I usually go out to the 50, both teams warming up. We always see the coaches come shake hands. That's where you get an assistant coach, you know, running back coach or a coordinator, and it's just like everything comes out. They have no concern about injuries, about what they're going to do, not going to do, who's playing, not playing. Like they let it all out then. That's when I get my best information. So, then I got to go jam everything back in, have a conversation with Tom and Jordan, have a conversation with our producers, say, hey, we're going to have to talk about this or we're going to have to get to this or whatever it is. Um, and then obviously we get going. As far as meetings, everybody's pretty good to us. Like we, we don't have anybody that's just that's just not not good, doesn't offer good information. And I think it would surprise people. Coach Saban, for example, he's awesome. It's just you have to know what to talk to him about. So you can't. He doesn't want to talk about injuries. He doesn't want to talk about a lot of, you know, sort of sort of the BS topics or whatever. Like there was one time Tom asked Coach Saban, and, and seriously, he told me he was going to do this. And I literally looked over at Josh Max in the SID and I said, hey, this, I interrupted. I said, before he asks this, I, I'm out. And I looked at Saban and I said, I want you to know I'm not a part of this. He asked Coach Saban, so getting towards the end of the year, do you um, – do you do leave guys in games a little bit longer if it's a blowout to try to help push them for individual awards? And I mean, I'm in like, he start. that's when coach Samus starts rocking and tapping his foot a little bit. And I'm just like, Oh God, here it comes. <laughs> and so, I mean, but if you talk to him, like the, the best example I have is going into the Vanderbilt game last year, obviously they had a big 50, 50 ball wide receiver. And I'm asking coach, I said, I was like, how did, how do you coach a DB to play a back shoulder fade? Because we see it all the time. And when some guys play it great, some guys look lost. I know your guys are going to get it this week. Can you just kind of take us through the coaching points? He stands up and starts taking us through the technique and the fundamentals of how he coaches it, where your eyes have to be, how your shoulders have to be, what they're reading on a wide receiver. It was incredible stuff. Like he's sitting there, he is coaching us in the meeting room. But you just have to understand those are the things that he loves talking about. Um, and so that, I mean, that, that meeting was, was incredible. Like he, was, he told us about the eyes on a DB read a receiver's hips. I have never heard this. And I've been around football a long time. I did not know a DB reads a receiver's hips when they're coming out of their stance. So you get those things from him that are remarkable. And he actually spends a lot of time with us. But some of the guys over the years, like Kevin Steele is – I mean, he's basically like a, a college football storybook when you meet with him. I mean, he'll just be talking to you like, well, uh, I remember back in, you know, 94 when at Nebraska and Tommy Frazier, and we ran this play. And, I mean, it's, just, it's unbelievable his memory and the detail and the things he goes into. And he's just – he's always fun. Um, Sam Pittman is a joy. Like – Open book, honest, holds nothing back. You see exactly why his team reacts to him the way that they do because it's no BS. It's no nonsense. You ask him a question, he's like, well, this and this and this. And you're kind of like, I can't believe you just said that, but that's pretty amazing. And a lot of it's off the record. Um, Marcus Satterfield's a name that will probably surprise you. Uh, Offensive coordinator at South Carolina last year going to Nebraska. Like you talk about a no holds barred, no nonsense does not give a damn, will tell you anything and be bluntly obvious about it. Like, I mean, he just lays it out there. And it, but we appreciate that because it's no coach speak. Uh, like Coach Golis at Tennessee was great last year. He was fun. Maybe the best all time, though, would be Jeremy Pruitt because everything that I just said and then some. And, you know, you get the accent and you get kind of the quirkiness. And, I mean, Jeremy was just, I man, y'all got, y'all got best job in America. <laughs> I could, I would love, is that all y'all y'all do is just watch film and get paid for that? Like, I would trade jobs with y'all in a heartbeat. And I'm thinking they're like, yeah, coach, you're making five million, man. I would trade with you too. Like, let's, like, when you're ready to flip this script, just, just tell me. I'll trade paychecks tomorrow. Um, but he was just so honest and he knows ball. And so that's the best part too. Like, you can ask him any kind of scheme question and he's like, boom, 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 brings it up right away. So 
all these guys in this league are awesome. And this, I think it's because we get them often. They know us. They trust us. We haven't burned them. Like, Lane is great. You would think that he's he's not great, but he's awesome. Like he, I love talking football with Lane Kiffin. He's fantastic. Um, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head other guys that we, that we love kind of meeting with. But it's – like, Coach Stoops is great. And he'll give you – like, he gets going in old Youngstown stories and talking about his brothers and stuff. Like, that's that can be really cool. And he's very direct and very honest with us about his guys. So – they're all a little bit different in how they approach it and how they answer questions, but man, it's cool to be able to sit there and just talk ball with all those guys. Let me tell you what I've what I've eventually found a way to do. So the first thing I've noticed is those guys um, instinctively don't trust anyone, nor would I if I were in their position. But if you gain their trust and they realize you're going to talk to them on a level they want to talk on, then all of a sudden there's this detachment and they go from not trusting you, won't give you anything to you're looking at them saying, I can't believe you're giving me this. And that, ha- that happens like that once yep. you instill the trust. The other thing is, and here's what's been really fun slash humbling for me, if you ask them to give you feedback on your work on air, they can't wait to do it. Because they've, they've got opinions <laughs> on everyone, but nobody in our business has ever gone to them and said, Coach, I want your pure, unadulterated feedback. And they'll give it to you, man. It's brutal. It's always negative, but in a positive way, if that makes any sense. It's been a huge help, man. That's like that's been the biggest unsung blessing, I think, of getting the access that we get. You get feedback that doesn't come from a consulting firm. It doesn't come from someone in a production suite. It comes from someone that's actually out there on the field of battle that you only you only sit off to the side and you talk about. It's wild though when you finally get that. Well, and sometimes you get it without asking. Because it's it's what you did in other places. So there are, there are a couple of coaches that'll say, "Yeah, I heard what you said about our defense two weeks ago, on Feinbaum," or "Oh yeah, no, I I, I heard that interview with so and so when you were talking about my quarterback. I I, I saw it. Not good. Not wasn't good. <laughs> They're not afraid to tell us that. And and here's the other part too that I think has this was a realization I had a, a year and a half, two years ago, and it took me a while to kind of get it. Is that we all think that there's one language we speak to these coaches, and it's football, right? But you have to go a step further than that. Each coach speaks a different language of football. Yeah. And once you learn that, Mike Leach was a perfect example of that. That's why Mike Leach was my biggest professional challenge that I've ever had. Now, some people might think that it was Nick Saban because you know, he does, he, he's, he's brash with the media, whatever it is. It's just not true, first and foremost. Or, you know, Jim Harbaugh, who sprints off the field. I had the Peach Bowl with him one time. I'm literally running, just trying to get one. Jim, you're a quarterback trying to get in. And I think he kind of respected that I tried. So he slowed down and gave me like a one-word answer and then ran back in the tunnel. But it, with Nick Saban, it's football detail, man. Like, that's what he wants. I try to get creative with Coach Leach, and I would say things like they had some protection breakdowns against Kentucky. I tried to – I'm – I don't remember exactly how I said it, but I, I phrased my question something like, you know, coach, your, your quarterback's having some protection issues. The fortress that is your kingdom that protects him, how do you better fortify that for the second half? F- hoping that he would go some art of war, like World War II novel that he had read something or other, and he would like, mess the two worlds together. I sat on the field with him before that game. I tucked my microphone, like I had my microphone like this, like I tucked it right here and I had my arms crossed. Yeah. And I just started asking him random questions, thinking we'd get something good for the game. We actually used like two of his answers. And my first question, I said, Coach, if, if Will Rogers was a dinosaur, what kind of dinosaur would you want him to be? And I mean like no hesitation whatsoever. He said, well, I, I would want him to be a, one that was fast enough to get away from bigger and badder dinosaurs so he wouldn't get eaten. And I was like, that's a wacky answer, but it, it's perfect. Like, you want your quarterback to not take sacks so he can get away from big, bad defensive linemen that are coming after him. So, I asked him, like, Mountain Lake, which would he choose? He went back and forth on that. I asked him, Lobster Shrimp, he went Mussels. I mean, it, some of it has nothing to do with anything. He doesn't like to talk about football a bunch, but you have to understand, like, that's his language. So, try to speak it to him in his language. With Like, with Lane Kiffin, for example, I've gotten to the point with Lane – either halftime or postgame, I literally walk up to him and just hold my microphone out. <laughs> and he, he starts talking. I don't even have to ask him anything. So you have to understand that there's a football language that's different for every coach. And once I realized that, 
it became a lot easier and I got much better answers with where I wanted to go. Like Kirby is, he wants to talk football, but he, he enjoys other parts of it a little bit more. Like he wants to talk about what a win means for different reasons. He wants to talk about why his guys got to where they got. He's big on giving credit to his players and why they accomplished certain things. So I try to lead him into those kind of answers with the questions that I ask. But it's a great point that you bring up because it's, yes, we speak football to all these guys, but they all speak their own individual football language. I think Kirby's probably the best example I know of in college football right now of a guy who keeps the main thing the main thing, but at the same time is aware of the overarching, is aware of what's being said, is aware of what will be said when something happens, and they can claim all they want to that they don't pay attention to it. I think he does, but the benefit in the uniqueness of him is it doesn't really, it never impacts what they do. It's, It's an awareness like I'm awareness, uh, I'm aware of what the high temperature in Juneau, Alaska is today. It's not going to impact how I dress. He's aware of what everyone says about him. It just doesn't impact it. I think if you can balance that now, you're, you're fine. And you also, you sound informed because nothing in a press conference ever takes you off guard because you already know what's being said. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't leave yet. Don't leave yet. Make sure you like the video and please subscribe to the channel. Not just for me. That's how we keep this entire thing free.